Um, uh, so Minsky and Chomsky, they started their career in the 50s questioning methods that are popular again. And I think a lot of their work is rejected because it's seen as too negative. That is, engrams can't do this and nets can't do that. I'll get to this. But I think there's a more positive spin that they proposed an organization of the literature, what's now known as the Chomsky hierarchy and what we study in, in undergraduate algorithms. And um, this, I think, is very useful. And deep nets need something like this. And we'll propose something like that at the end of the talk. So um, actually, Fred Jelinek's name came up a few times already. Uh, and uh, I have two independent sources. This is a paper I wrote almost 10 years ago. I call The Pendulum Swung Too Far. But basically, it starts out by saying, at least in the ACL, in the late 80s, there were almost no statistical papers. And a decade later, there were almost no non-statistical papers. Um, and so it looks like uh, there's a, um, a real simple trend here. But um, if I plot it on a longer scale, and this isn't really fit to data, that red line is the previous plot. And what we see is that it seems like every uh, 20 years or so, it flips back and forth between rationalism and empiricism. And the, the, the prediction in that paper was that we should be back at rationalism today. Uh, well, maybe not. But anyway, um, uh, this, this is an alternative view which is uh, Fernando Pereira has this blog post where he talks about an act, uh, um, uh, a farce in three acts, act one, rationalism, act two, the empiricism. He sort of predates the previous act before rationalism. But anyway, now we're in deep nets. Um, and I'm going to say that seems a little more likely for right now. And my uh, uh, prediction may be not so good. Um, now, I want to say the prediction wasn't a prediction, but it was a desperate plea for inclusiveness. And, <laughs> okay, uh, even then I think it was pretty implausible. And the fear was that we were so successful in reviving empiricism that there's no longer much room for anything else. And the history of EMNLP, when we sort of started it, ACL was rejecting all our stuff. They used to be a combination of humanities and engineering, but not what we were doing. And then EMNLP reached out to include more things like statistics and, and also more geography. Um, and now ACL has sort of adopted most of those innovations, but they've forgotten humanities. And um, what I'd like to say is that we'd all be better together if we could get along. Um, OK. Now, um, sort of one method I like to do is proof by massive reference or reference to other people. So I will say, I didn't say it, but he said it. And um, you can go find the, the inner speech talk on, on the web. And uh, I, he gave the similar talk at inner speech in Mackel. Um, and uh, he uses the history of the word ketchup and in other places the word ice cream, um, not only the word but the food, um, to shed light on popular methods in, in our community and to embrace diversity. Um, he traces the etymology of ketchup from an Asian fish sauce to um, um, basically you take that fish sauce and then you add advances in sailing technology and you can replace the anchovies with cheap tomatoes and sugar from other parts of the world. And then you have something that's really not at all like the original. Um, the ice cream story is kind of similar where he starts with fruit syrup from Persia and then gets gunpowder from China and advances in refrigeration. And we end up with something that's not like the original. Um, and then he has this thing he calls the ketchup model of innovation. That's his slide I took a piece of, um, where he's borrowing technology from the neighbors and using interdisciplinary stuff to create um, innovation and, um, and embrace diversity. So he's casting a big tent. Now. Um, I added the speech invasion. He tends to be more diplomatic than that. Um, but in speech meetings, but not in language meetings, okay, he credits uh, the speech researchers for the innovation in language. <laughs> All right. um, and uh, he sort of dates, this is his chart, and he's saying something happened in 1988. And what happened then? Well, he, his pictures of, well, we mentioned Fred Jelinek. 
Um, th these are all very old pictures. None of these people look like that anymore. Um, okay. Um, any rate, he says that it was... What's that? All right, so one exception. <laughs> all right, the rest of us, well, <laughs> all right. Um, okay, at least most of us are still alive, so that's good. Um, one thing I want to quibble with, and I'm going to use this yellow when I'm sort of pointing to somebody else. That logo was banned from AT&T in 1983, and he's now referring to 1988. So that logo is the wrong one. You should have used the Death Star. Um, okay, um, uh, that was before 1983. Anyway, it's close enough. Um, now, I think his story is nice and simple, uh, but history isn't. Um, in my opinion, speech did on to language what was done on to speech. Um, <laughs> okay. And um, there's another talk by a speech guy um, at the same meeting where Jarofsky gave his, and that's the link to the audio, uh, to the video. Actually, that's the link to both videos. And... Um, in that one, he takes a slide from Furui, who I think was mentioned earlier. And um, Furui says something happened in 1975. And what happened in 1975 to speech is the same thing that happened in 1988 to language. And it was done by the same guys. And those same guys did it again to hedge funds in 1990, and they did it to politics uh, just recently. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, uh, that's probably the bigger story, but I'm only going to talk about speech and language. Um, at any rate, um, there is this uh, J Fred Jelinek, whose name keeps coming up. Um, um, he gave this talk when he won the Zampoli Prize at LREC, um, which is a title which um, um, I, I found pretty offensive at the time. Um, but then I learned when at Fred's memorial from his wife that she was a student of Roman Jakobson. Um, and uh, I guess many, I don't know, do I need to explain who Roman Jakobson is or no? Okay. Any rate. Roman Jakobson was teaching at the Rockland University before the Second World War. Right. Yes. He's, so he's, I gather he's Russian, but you know, there's some Czech connection, no? Right. Then he worked some time with Dodd, and then about 36, 35, he was working here in Vernon for some time at Tom Vernon, uh -huh. and he ran away to, to Harvard. From, to, to Harvard, yes. <laughs> right. Because Nazis were not after him. Sorry. For no, 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 no. That, but look, I, I couldn't have said it that well, so, right? Okay. Um, so look, so w you know, so Fred really does say things like this, but you know, he really his heart's in the right place. Um, <laughs> um, he really wanted to be a linguist, um, and he went to Cornell to work with a linguist, but um, Hockett decided to go write operas. Um, so at any rate, uh, he did. So Fred did information theory instead. Um, at any rate. Um, this is where Fred says that he said it, and you can go find this on the web. Um, now, um, Fred, in, this, in that talk, he quotes Eric Brill with this thing, where um, w this is the side, as the training set increases, performance on some task that I won't even talk about gets better and better and better. There are all these different machine learning things, and everybody who's working on machine learning keeps publishing that my point's better than their points, but there's always some point in which that's true. Um, <laughs> but um, that's beside the point. Um, uh, <laughs> that the real point... <laughs> um, okay, so there's no data like more data. And um, now, uh, Eric comes up... <laughs> Okay, so I asked Eric, who was my boss at the time, if he really said that, and he sent me an email that said that he did say it, but I left off the smiley face. So, okay. Um, any rate, um, now another colleague of mine, Bob Moore, who's no relationship to Gordon Moore, um, uh, basically made the right point that this curve is really important because I can use it to, inter to extrapolate, to say, uh, how much more data do I need to collect to get such and such performance? 
and I can do a pretty good job of forecasting my ability to collect data. So I could then do a pretty good job of forecasting when I'll have such and such performance. So I agree with everything the previous speaker said that we're now in the awkward situation of having to explain to the popular people what we can't do or when we will have such and such. And this is, a, I think, a nice story about for forecasting. And I'll get back to this later. Now, um, I do want to talk about end-to-end -end versus representation, and I do want to, I'll say a little more about firing linguists. So um, at Bob Mercer's Lifetime Achievement Award, there was this introduction by the president of the ACL at the time um, where he says that Jelinek uh, said, every t said this thing about firing linguists, but he didn't believe it. Um, Mercer never said it, but he believed it, <laughs> all right? And Mercer did, in fact, confirm in the video that he does believe it. Um, okay, Fred wasn't there to, to comment. Um, uh, all right. Now, the reason that I actually fed that line to the president was because I knew that Bob was going to win the Lifetime Achievement Award, but I also knew that the very next day I was going to have to speak at a workshop in memory of Chuck uh, Chuck Fillmore, who was an earlier one, and Chuck takes a different view on this question. And I was going to have to walk back this paper that I wrote with Bob, where I'm the first author, and um, explain why it is that you know Chuck's position, which is different than Bob's position, deserved to be heard. Um, and Bob actually gave this argument in his Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, I won't play that part of it, but. What he's talking about doing in end-to-end -end is replacing the dictionary and the lexicographers and all the linguists who were involved in the dictionary with the spelling. And so we're going to use the input as the spelling, the output is the, is the, um, the synthesis or the recognition, the audio. And what we want is a mapping between spelling and audio and have no linguistics in the middle. Um, now that's... That's been Bob's vision forever. Um, and he was really quite proud of how much progress they had made on that at that time. Um, and um, I'm going to say that when I used the yellow that I didn't say that. That was even though I'm the first author. But all right, that's the problem. Now, here's the evidence that I didn't say it. Um, so those words are things that's classic Bob. It, when you write papers with people, the question is, can you figure out which paragraph which author wrote? Um, right, okay. And um, there's more of Bob. Um, but uh, now that one is great evidence because by the summer of 1977, I was still an undergraduate. Um, and um, at Yorktown, it would take another three decades before I got to Yorktown. Uh, so this work was really done by... by by those guys, by Bob and Jelinek and all those guys. Uh, but they were really into end-to-end -end very early. Now, um, uh, I happen to have what um, um, Chuck had said about this because his Lifetime Achievement Award was recorded and all that. And his view, which is more like Roman Jakobson's, is that sound and meaning is sort of legitimate and spelling is not. All right? And I have a two-minute video here. There may be primitive communities, but there are no primitive languages. The minor protagonists in these conversations contested each of these principles, and the linguist hero, from his vast knowledge of the most exotic of the world's languages, kept showing them how wrong they were. Studying Japanese brought me to one issue in representation, and this has to do with the kana syllabary. One of the themes in this talk is the reality that it's not possible to represent in a writing system, in a parse, or in a grammar, every aspect of a language. So for a given representation system, it's important to know what is on display and what is missing. Studying Japanese brought me to one issue in representation, and this has to do with the common <laughs> syllabary. The pronunciation of Japanese words is represented by the symbols of a syllabary but the components of complex words in this language, in particular the inflected verbs, are not segmented as syllable boundaries. 
Some verbs have consonant final stems followed by vowel initial suffixes, but this fact is not apparent in the written record. In this slide, the colored symbols represent syllables that contain morpheme boundaries. The top two are the plain and polite ways to say moves. The third is does not move, and the bottom example is can move. The second symbol that you see in each of those lines conceals the end of the verb stem and the beginning of the suffix. The written form of a language should not prevent you from discovering these boundaries. All right. Um, look, we could debate whether a neural net could probably figure that out, but um, you know, his point, I think, is that the, the spelling system in Japanese is not the most parsimonious for seeing the sound. Um, of course, in English, it's pretty not parsimonious either. But anyway, um, uh, now let me talk about trying to extrapolate. So the methods that um, Fillmore's colleagues were working on are extremely manually intensive. And the question is, could we, could we work together to speed up what they want to do? So a lot of the things they want to do, I think, are quite you know, interesting and legitimate. But I think the methods are a little too tedious. Um, so just as statistical parsers can now probably handle phrase structure rules, could we try to handle the kinds of things they want to do next? And, and what kinds of collect data sets would we need to, work to do that? So um, let's say that um, the frequency of most content words are in the range of parts per million. And in the 1970s, when we had one million words, we could make a list of common content words. Um, 20 years later, we had 100, more time, 100 times more data, and then we could look at things like phrasal verbs, save x from y. And um, you could use that to figure out how to, whether these ambiguous constructions are left associative or right associative. Um, most parsers I want to uh, point out are trained on the brown corpus, which is only a million words. So that's too small to even see phrasal verbs, let alone anything like conjunction. Um, now, we're getting to the point, we actually now have a trillion words. That's a million squared. So we can now look at pairs of content words. All right? And it's now, I think, just getting possible to do what those guys wanted to do. Um, and we could sort of speed up the calc you know, how to compute those things. Um, now, one thing I've been very interested in, my first uh, journal paper was on the Catalan numbers. The Catalan numbers are the number of binary trees you can draw over n leaves. And uh, things like conjunction are every way ambiguous, which means the syntax is telling you nothing. The only way to parse these would be to look at the words. And you need to know what's comparable, what you can compare and what you can contrast. And that's now just becoming possible. But you can't do it by just um, using the brown corpus. You're going to need much more than that. So um, you know, do we have to choose, or could we work together? Now let me talk about word to vec for a moment. So uh, a lot of people are really excited by word to vec, and I think they think that maybe word to vec would make it unnecessary to have any kind of linguistic resources. We no longer would need uh, WordNet, for example. Now, uh, so the idea is the similarity of two words is just represented as a cosine of two vectors. Um, this is obviously symmetric. Um, now, there's a lot of literature right now what's called retrofitting. So people have figured out that, and we, we kind of knew this back in the day, that, co um, that, that uh, distributional hypothesis, you shall know a word by the company it keeps, all of that co-occurrence co would map synonyms and antonyms together and separate them from words that are incomparable. Um, now, what they like to do with retrofitting is say, well, synonyms should have a cosine of like plus one, antonyms should have a cosine like minus one, and incomparable around zero, and they find some way to fudge it so it's true. Um, now, the problem is that that's just the simplest of all these cases. We have lots of things that aren't even symmetric. So a car is a vehicle, but a vehicle isn't a car, and how are you going to get that out of the symmetry and so on? So um, I think that lexical semantics is far more interesting than um, just co-occurrence. Co-occurrence is important, and it's useful, but it's not the whole answer. Now, um, a lot of people don't really know what is word to vec doing, and I think the best story around is a suggestion that's in a NIPS paper by Levy and Goldberg that says that it's basically what we were doing 
in the uh, 20 years earlier with point-wise mutual information. And at that point, it was pretty obvious that point-wise mutual information groups together synonyms and antonyms, but also word association. And I wouldn't want to say that bread and butter are synonyms or antonyms, but they're not um, incomparable either. They're perfectly good to compare and contrast, um, doctor, nurse, this kind of thing. Um, so this is some of the work we did back in the day. And one of the things I want to point out is that the number, the counts are growing quite a bit. So we, we were working with 15 million words of text, and we had only 621 doctors at that time. Nowadays, and this is actually an old slide I got from Google, but it's probably over a trillion. Um, I think the counts are going up about 1,000 X per decade, and the mechanism is that disks are getting cheaper at that rate. And so if, if, if um, the world is basically entering text into Google at the rate that they can buy disks. Um, this has got to end at some point because um, there's something I call the population limit. That is, people only have so much time to enter text into Google, and there's only so many people, and they're going to run out of time to do it. But for a while, they've been limited by the disk space. <laughs> um, anyway, a rising tide of data lifts all boats. So as these cones go up, then many things become quite much more feasible. I think that came out in the previous talk. Um, I do find, though, it inspirational to go and be familiar with the history. I, when we did this work on point-wise mutual information, I happened to be at Bell Labs, and that's where the, a lot of the word association stuff came out of. And um, this was uh, an old paper showing the doctor, nurse, and bread and butter. Those examples that I used with doctor weren't chosen at random. And the basic observation here is that people do a lot of these reaction time things faster and more accurately in a context that's primed. So if, if I'm asking you to push a button when you hear an N, you're going to uh, recognize the word nurse much more quickly if it's in a predictable context than if it's not. Um, now, what about word to vec? One of the things I'm interested in is what is it that it's about papers that get them to be highly cited? Um, and I try to teach students this. And, and one of the things I want to point out is that the most highly cited papers typically are not the first or especially not the last. If you're the last paper, you don't get cited. Um, okay. um, and it's generally not the best either. Um, there were lots of papers that, are, um, you know, that might be first, last, or best on any of those topics. But I want to say that what word -Vec does is it's simple and it's accessible. Anybody can download the code and use it and they can, and often it's a, it's a point of departure to do something else, and that's what the field really appreciates, is if you support them in doing their work. And so this is, is I think, quite deservedly gets lots of citations for that. Now, um, a lot of claims are being made for word to vec So um, um, there's stuff about the PMI and, and things being associated. There's also something about linguistic features. And what I mean by a feature is something like this red line, something that kind of splits the vocabulary in half. Um, and um, we'll get to that in a moment. There's a lot of interest in these analogies. People are really amazed when you can say, man is to woman as king is to X. What is X? And it gets the desired answer, queen. And it can do quite a few of these. There was uh, earlier work on vector spaces and information retrieval, um, but I don't think Salton really suggested that you could add or subtract vectors. People did do work on SVD of these things before, but um, this, kind, this is a, a PCA. Uh, um, it's like a projecting onto two dimensions, much higher number of dimensions, and it gives you a nice graphical interpretation. And obviously, it's a convenient starting point for neural nets. Now, so let's look at this analogy for a minute. The man is to woman as king is to queen. And one of the things that I find interesting is that it's interesting that queen comes out in top position. But if I look at the top 10, um, uh, they all have some properties that are working well and some not so well. Um, so these near misses are kind of instructive. Uh, now, what I'm interested in with the near misses is that I want to say the right answer should be royal, and it should be feminine, and it should be singular. And I want to say that the combinatorics, that, that in fact, all of these guys are royal. 
but um, their uh, number and gender, it's probably pretty random. And the combinatorics are that if, if I'm trying to just get collocations, word that go together, then these methods work pretty well. So if I wanted to find a, a, a small set of words that are royal, where k is a small number, the combinatorics of v choose k are a lot better than things trying to split the vocabulary in half. And that trying to split the vocabulary in half in gender or number is much harder. There are so many ways to split the vocabulary in half that um, this is probably not the best way to find that way of splitting. There are more obvious features and indications of gender and number, like agreement facts. <laughs> and this is probably not, co-occurrence is probably not your best way to find gender and number. It's probably pretty better for royalty than gender and number. And so what I want to say is that, that it's worth thinking about the representation issues a little bit, trying to bring together the representation issues and the modern methods. And we could be better if we can work together. Um, so I'm going to use this slide when I'm sort of switching topics, where we're going back and forth and back and forth. Um, so uh, what about all this negativity? Uh, Chomsky said, you know, that, that engrams can't do this, and Minsky said nets can't do that. And there, it's basically the same argument, two sides. Chomsky said that engrams didn't have enough generative capacity, enough memory to do what he wanted to do. And Minsky said that uh, Nets had too much memory to do what he, what he wanted to do. So the too little is that engrams are a special case of finite state. Finite state doesn't have the generative capacity to, do, to capture the long distance dependencies that he was interested in. On the flip side, Minsky was talking about, well, he started with XOR. And everybody said, why didn't he consider hidden layers? Actually, he did. Um, but um, in order to do XOR, you need a second-order polynomial. And to do parity, which is what he was really talking about, uh, if you wanted to do parity of a 64-bit word, you need a 65th-order polynomial. I'll explain that in a bit in a second. And his point was that parity is easy to compute with a finite state machine. I shouldn't need... Um, linear space to do something I can do in constant space. And so these are two flip sides of the same argument. Now, one point I want to make before I get into the details of those arguments is that Chomsky is an amazing debater. His arguments carried the day partly on the merits of the case, but also because he's just such a good debater. Um, and he would use these expressions, and I've tried using some of these expressions recently, and the reviewers get all over my case, saying, why are you doing that? I'm saying, well, in fact, that's code language that says that I'm quoting Chomsky, but um, um, people don't know that anymore. So <laughs> anyway, um, uh, Minsky's writing, on the other hand, is much less accessible. He comes from a background in math and dives into theorem proofs, theorem proofs, and never really discusses motivation or any, any of the rhetoric. It's just, you know, just into the deep math. And people just, you know, that's why they'd say, why didn't he talk about hidden layers? It's because they didn't read it. <laughs> um, all right, it's too hard. Um, anyway, here's the finite state machine that computes parity, and that's obviously finite state. Um, now, here's a, a figure from his book in which he's trying to say that an nth order polynomial uses linear space to capture the, the, par the parity of this. And you shouldn't need uh, linear space to do a finite state problem. Right? And so that's why he's rejecting nets, is saying there's too much capacity for such a simple problem. Now, this is from another figure on his on the left. I juxtapose it with this figure on the right. Okay? I think the figure on the right is probably a little easier to understand, but the idea is that Local computations don't always fit together globally, all right? And that's sort of obvious. Um, and now the bigger question is, do modern net methods for language capture long-distance dependencies, all right? Um, and the received wisdom is that the modern methods work better than the n-grams because they do this capture the long-distance dependencies. Um, now the practice is that you scramble sentences in the training. I don't know if this is well known or not, but it's done, okay? And the reason they do this is because there's IID assumptions that are in this model that the sentences are gen generated randomly, um, and they therefore don't capture any dependencies that go across sentences. Now, um, 
uh, you can read that, you know. Um, but the idea is see no evil and um, certainly admit no evil. Um, at any rate, the engrams condition on the recent past. Um, I'm going to call these arrogance assumptions. And then they fit the engrams with a Poisson. And this is the arrogant assumption, to assume that everything I haven't thought of doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and there are variants on that simple model, which I'll call topic models, cache models, and including the modern neural nets. Um, and arrogance is to condition on what you can afford to condition on and then forget about everything else. In reality, the variance that's left over is always bigger than the expected value. And the suggestion is that you should estimate the variance, your uncertainty, and discover just how much difference there is here. And don't scramble the sentences. There are ways to, to model that. And you don't have to assume that the variance is the same as the mean. Now, this is a more formal way of getting into it. There's this thing called D, the index of dispersion, which is just the ratio of the variance to the mean. And um, um, what I'm saying is you split the corpus in some natural way, um, and then you're going to compute the mean and the variance of all your n-grams or whatever the units are um, over the documents. And what you're going to observe is that the variant, the d, this d is always much bigger than 1. If, if it was Poisson, the d should be about 1, but it's always much bigger than that. And the reason it's always much bigger than that is because there are always global constraints you didn't model, things across that there's coherence. Um, this is Google Trends for the word elections, or, and this is time. And you can see that elections are not random over time, and there's some elections that are more important than other elections. Right. Um, and that's sort of obvious, but it's, it's going to be not random over everything, and there will always be things you couldn't afford to condition on, and they're always going to matter. Um, so you, LSTMs can't capture that. And so the LSTMs are introducing these inappropriate assumptions. They're maybe not as bad as some of the other inappropriate assumptions, but they're still inappropriate. Um, and uh, uh, now, I want to say what's interesting here. A lot of people are sort of modeling the baseline. And I want to say it's deviations from the, plus, um, from the baseline that is what's interesting. So the Poisson and other independence assumptions are not bad for random strings, okay? but things are not random. The deviations from Poisson is indicate when you see a deviation from, from the baseline, that is indication of something interesting. Um, so the clues for the hidden variables. The hidden variables are things that we're interested in. Um, and so in mutual information, we were talking about saying the joint probability of seeing doctor and nurse in some context, if it's much bigger than chance, then you know that doctor and nurse have a relationship. So you're looking for deviations from chance, not chance. Everybody's talking about how to model the baseline. Obviously, you've got to model the baseline in order to see the deviations, but it's the deviations that are exciting. Now, here's another deviation from a baseline. The top is the brown corpus. There's 500 documents in the brown corpus. They're broken up into genres, and uh, so they're not random, um, the document numbers. And um, um, the, uh, the bars that you can't, probably can't see are the, the number of times that the word said occurs in each of the 500 documents. Down here, I have circles for the same things up there. What I want to point out is that more than 10% of these documents don't mention the word said. And that wouldn't be expected under a Poisson. And then even more surprising, there are enormous numbers of documents that mention the word said 15 or more times. And there's no way that could happen by chance. So obviously the word said is not independent of documents. And common words like said are closer to Poisson than interesting words like good keywords. We'll get to that. So adaptation is how do the probabilities change as we read a document? So the intuition is that if a word has been seen recently, there's both positive and negative adaptation. The positive adaptation is the probability of the word you, you've seen recently and its, and its friends, its related words, a small set of words, their probabilities are going to go up by a lot. And the negative adaptation is that a very large number of words, their probabilities are going to go down by a little. And the two of these will cancel. So I want to say that positive adaptation is much bigger than the prior. Negative adaptation, not so much. 
And by much bigger, I mean orders of magnitude and not so much, I mean factors of two or three. Now, there are a lot of methods in the literature, and I'm not going to go through all of them. The cash-based is one that Fred wrote about, among others. Um, I don't think it has enough um, leverage to get these order of magnitude effects. Um, the parametric models, I think, are right on, but I don't want to get into the math because it's a little complicated and people tune out, and it's not necessary. Um, really, all you need is this is what adaptation is. What's the probability of seeing this word again, given that I've seen it once? So what's the probability of seeing it two more times, given I've seen it one or more times? That's what I'm saying is adaptation. And you can figure it out if I know what the probability is of seeing one of these words in the document and what probability of none of these words in the document. Then you know the whole thing. And generally, those first two terms are actually pretty easy to estimate. Count the number of documents that mention it no times. Count the number of documents that mention it once, and we're done. Um, now, um, non, you can do it non-parametrically, and I've got two suggestions for how to do that. The idea is you split each document into two equal pieces. I'll call the first half the history, the second half the test. And then given one, I want to predict the other. And so we get a contingency table. This is the word um, hostages. And I had 638 documents in this collection that mention hostages in both halves. And I have about the same number that mention in one half and not the other. And I have a huge number that don't mention it at all. And this is obviously not independent. There is obviously a dependency between the first half and the second half. And we can state it pretty clearly here. So the prior is that. And then we have positive adaptation is this, and negative adaptation is that. And what you can see is that I did it in four different pieces of the, of the AP News, and that the difference between the prior and the positive adaptation is orders of magnitude. And the difference between prior and negative adaptation is factors of two or three. And here's a plot of it. The, uh, Microsoft does this weird thing when you plot on log scale. So this is 100% uh, um, and this is 1% 1 1 here that you can see that to go from prior to at a positive is, is orders of magnitude. And to go from here to here is not so much. One thing you can see is that the last year, 1993, is somehow different than the other three years. There was something going on in the United States where we were really fixated on hostages. And then we had an election, and we turned as we got interested in something else. Um, anyway, here's the way of thinking of that. So the magnitude is huge. That's on a log scale. So that's many orders of magnitude. This is the probability of seeing the first one, and that's the probability at the top of seeing it again. Um, the Prague School talks about new information and given information. I want to say the first mention of something is marked, very surprising. This is the first mention. The odds of it are parts per million. The subsequent mention is like a pronoun. It's a function word. The chance that I'll talk about what I'm talking about is like the chance I'll use a pronoun. And the probability of using a pronoun is independent of the probability of whatever it refers to. <laughs> so once I put it on the table, it's on the table. I can refer to it again very easily. <laughs> so it's unmarked and doesn't depend on frequency. Second is unmarked, less surprising, independent of frequency. And then priming, I didn't talk about it, but I, priming is somewhere in between. Um, now here's another method where I just say, I just count how many documents mention this word one or more times, how many mention it two or more times, and then I can estimate adaptation directly from that. And you get a picture that looks very similar. So this is the first mention, that's the second mention, that's the third mention. Uh, both the second and third mention don't depend on probability. They're both extremely likely, but um, each one gets more and more likely. Um, and, and then I can show the two views and show that the first mention is kind of about the same. And then the subsequent mention is sort of similar. The picture on the left allows me to talk about priming, and the one on the right allows me to talk about third and fourth mentions and so on. But anyway, here we get a nice picture of, of these things. And they're not at all uh, um, random, and they're not at all Poisson. All right. Um, it also depends a lot on content words. So um, uh, Kennedy and accept are about equally likely. The priors are quite similar. Um, but K 
Kennedy is a better content word than accept. Accept is a function word. And what's the difference? Kennedy adapts a lot. That is, the positive adaptation is much, much bigger. Accept doesn't tell me much about what's going on with the meaning, and so the difference between the first mention and subsequent mentions are much smaller. So that the difference between content words and function words has been said to be frequency, but I want to say it's the second moment, not the first moment, that matters. Um, so we can just summarize. All the things that I have up here are all symptoms of long-distance dependencies. They're not captured by arrogance. And I'm going to say the neural nets are, are not as arrogant as the older methods, but they're still arrogant. <laughs> all right, so let's change subjects. Um, n-grams can't do this, and nets can't do that. We've given this argument, but... Um, now, before, I think the earlier talk was talking about how we've got too much optimism right now, <laughs> all right? And somebody was telling me that neural nets can learn any function. And then they were actually referring to this blog post that didn't claim they could learn anything, but claimed they could compute anything, all right? And I said, really? What about the halting problem? And he said, the halting what? <laughs> all right, at any rate... For those of you who do or don't know what the halting problem is, there's a wonderful poem by Jeff Poem in the style of Dr. Seuss that explains the halting problem. And I would encourage you to go look it up. Um, I won't read it now, and it goes on much longer than this slide. Um, any rate, um, what I want to say that they did more constructively is they introduced this organization of the literature where we've got all of these... Um, you know, the Chomsky hierarchy, and you can make statements of time and space complexity. And parity is obviously in finite state, and it's a special case of that. And what we need is something similar to this for deep nets. So what can't these guys do? Well, I want to say that the exciting nets are also in here. The GPU is just a finite state machine, all right? And... Um, this is, you know, is a large set of things. It includes a lot of interesting stuff, but it's far from everything, all right? And um, there are things like neural Turing machines and stuff like that, neural nets. There are Turing neural nets and stuff like that that are outside of this level, but they're not where the excitement is. The excitement is all around GPUs. So obviously, these things can't do the halting problem because nothing can do the halting problem, all right? Um, and they, but they also can't do anything that's beyond linear time. So, you know, I, you say, well, the GPU is great at multiplying matrices. Yeah, but only if the matrix is small. This is not the way to compute page rank, an eigenvalue of the web, all right? Um, uh, um, this isn't even a way to sort a large matrix, and it obviously isn't a way to solve an NP-hard problem. Um, so... Uh, now, let's go back to Eric's slide. So we've got this problem that everybody's publishing. My, my, my learner is better than your learner at this one operating point, and we won't talk about the cases where it's not better. <laughs> um, now, I do want to say that in Eric's plot, up is up, all right, and that um, more is more. <laughs> um, okay. Um, now, here's another plot by some of my colleagues at Baidu where um, they're talking about loss instead of performance, so down is better, <laughs> okay? And, but they still agree that more is more. Um, and there's sort of three regions they talk about. There's the small training data where nothing matters, and then there's, there's some point of where I've got more than enough training data and it doesn't help anymore. Uh, I, those, the interesting areas in the middle where more is more. And what they have in mind here is fitting loss by a power law, and that um, it's alpha, the M is the training set size, to the beta plus gamma. And I want to say that alpha and gamma are uninteresting constants. And a lot of people work on optimizing those, but I want to say that part of the literature, I want to say I just don't care about, all right? I'm going to take a view kind of like algorithms here. Say the only thing I'm really interested in is beta. And there's some theory that says that beta should be this, all right? And that's great, but what we see in practice is that beta's never that good, <laughs> all right? What we see is that when we've got a problem that's working really well, beta is close to that. And when we have a problem that's not working so well, beta is farther from that. 
And so some tasks are more appropriate for these methods and some are less. And the ones that work better are the ones that t are better at taking advantage of more data. Um, and so what my colleagues at Baidu have done is to go measure beta on a whole bunch of tasks that are out there. And they can sort these tasks by beta, and we find that we never find a beta that's better than the theory. And the problems that people are excited by that's in speech and vision, beta is close to the theory. And the problems that we work about in, in computational linguistics, those, I would say, are opportunities for improvement, <laughs> right? Um, and um, so now, why is there more excitement in speech and vision and less excitement in language, right? And, and maybe it's that those guys are better than we are. <laughs> Okay, all right? And maybe it's they got better resources than we have, right? Um, maybe they just got easy problems, <laughs> okay? Um, and then maybe different problems are different. So there's this book called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, and they talk about system one and system two, and that system one is basically perception problems, things you do unconsciously you can't not do. So if somebody says my name, I can't not hear it. My name happens to be a function word in Hebrew, and so whenever somebody's talking on the phone in Hebrew, I think they're talking to me. Um, okay, and I, you know, it's just, that's, that's life. Okay, um, system two is stuff that you do, you can only do when you're awake <laughs> and when you're really thinking. And so I wanna say that perception is just different than reading. Perception is something that, you know, like speech and vision, I can't turn it off. Um, and, and reading is hard work. <laughs> um, and then there's a kind of question about representation. So both Chomsky and Minsky and, and Chuck Fillmore were talking about representation, all right? And, and it seems like it's representation, the case for representation might be more compelling in language, in reading, than it is in perception. Um, and that these guys were, I didn't put Fillmore in here, but they're pro-representation, and then there's other people who are pro end-to-end, -end, and maybe there, there's some truth for both positions. Um, and then I wanna say that could we, could we do better by working together? So I think it's exciting that these conferences are now talking about you know, um, more problems and that we can learn from each other, but maybe one of the things we learn from each other is how our problems are subtly different. Um, so uh, Minsky and Chomsky started their careers questioning methods that have since become popular. I think a lot of their work is being dismissed in the textbooks. Bishop, for example, just says, you know, that it was incorrect conjecture. And I think that's sort of in incorrect. Their work is, is important, but I would agree that it's, it is kind of negative. So there's a more positive spin, which is that we need an organization of the literature kind of like that. And the proposal was for organizing the literature would be to sort these problems by this beta and that there's no data like more data, but the exciting problems have better betas than the less exciting problems. Um, and now um, conclusions here are good news and bad news. The bad news is we aren't doing as well as they are. The good news is we've got room for improvement. <laughs> um, all right, I think there's a better together story and um, I don't think we have to choose between these two positions, all right? Um, and the suggestion is more humility and less arrogance. Let's not assume that the mean and the variance are the same, and, and let's not scramble our training data. All right, um, thank you. Yes. The one slide with the um, amount of training data from the Baidu colleagues. Yes. Is, isn't this what would we as humans do a lot? No, the, the one where you had the curve going down? Yeah. Um, I mean, like, if I want to, to judge somebody speaking English. Right. And then I hear for the first time a Philippine. Yeah. Then I try to, you know, get as much information out of how he speaks 
what makes the difference from a national speaker. And then I do it, I do it, I do it, do it I meet more Philippine. Yeah. And then there's a point where I don't adapt my model anymore. Yeah. I know I'm, you know, it, as long as I, as I find something new, then I say, I mean, it, so well, shouldn't we, when we come to a certain area, we mm -hmm. say, we're only gonna add that to our training data if it gives us something new. So yeah. it, we should, I mean, and basically that's like discriminative. So if you find somebody who is very close to the mean value of a certain class, then you kind of ignore that training data. After, a, if, you, if you read something. Mm -hmm. And then you, then, then, then you find something uh, uh, new that's a little bit further up, you say, oh, that's interesting, I include it. So wouldn't that help us by, instead of saying, okay, I'm gonna just go mm. on forever on the right side? Right. You're saying that there should be something we should be getting here. Um, no, I'm, yeah. I'm saying that oh. at some point, yeah. Yeah. you should try to decide, I'm gonna ignore that because I've already seen that, yeah. and I'm not gonna ignore it. And that's what humans do. Yeah. Like when I try to judge, he's speaking with a Chinese accent, sure. he's speaking, I mean, you know, okay. humans can judge when they hear the English, humans can judge with a good above chance level, but basically that's what they do. I, if I hear a Chinese yeah. person, I don't adapt my model anymore because I've heard enough Chinese. Right, people so, speaking English. so I'm an engineer um, and I get a little nervous when I hear the psychological reality stuff. And I'll tell you why, it's because my father's a psychologist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I started out sort of a little more, you know, sympathetic to that and I got a little more nervous. So on the, on the one side I'd say, yeah, there's probably some truth to what you're saying. On the other side, I keep, you know, I've been saying more is more. There's another more, Roger Moore, <laughs> okay? And Roger Moore is fond of sort of comparing the size of our training set sizes to the size of the training set a baby gets. And we're not as good as the baby is at taking advantage of the data. We have more data than a person's ever heard in their lifetime. And it's still not enough for us, <laughs> okay? So um, I'd say that, yeah, you're right. We should be able to use the data more effectively than we are, and the baby is the existence proof of it. Now there's another thing I find really very difficult and frustrating. Um, I spend a lot of time in China right now because my boss works in China and <laughs> I'm completely hopeless in Chinese. And, and what I'm aware of now is that if you see immigrant families anywhere, generally the kids often end up translating for the parents. Yeah. And, and that for some reason, the kids are just a lot better at what you're describing than the parents are, <laughs> okay? And, and I don't think our machines are even as good as the parents. <laughs> um, so I think we have, I would put this topic that you're talking about in the needs improvement bucket. Okay. <laughs> okay. is if you have me back in 20 years, um, uh, will anybody remember this talk? But you know, maybe they will because we have technology now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. So thank you very much.